Our next speaker, uh, Melissa Phillips Lipinska, she's going to. Uh, she's from the University of Tennessee. She's going to talk about endoscopic management of cholelithiasis. Thank you all for coming today and for allowing me to talk. Um, I'm taking a slightly different perspective than the speakers who have come before me, and that is, is that I am a surgeon trained in ERCP as well as performing the laparoscopic and open common bowel duct explorations. And because of that, I wanted to share with you the endoscopic side of things and kind of how that works as a step in the algorithm that I use for the management of these patients. Here we go. These are my disclosures, and none of them will influence my presentation today. Sorry, still figuring out the mouse. So as have been brought up in other talks today, the imaging of the common bile duct, I think, is a very important thing in evaluating these patients prior to any intervention, whether that's endoscopic or surgical. ERCP used to be the gold standard for both diagnosis and therapeutics. And I think that's evolved over time. And the reason that I have this past tense was is specifically that I think the diagnostic component of ERCP has been replaced by many other mo modalities. Specifically, transabdominal ultrasound is the most available and most commonly used and has a sensitivity of 55% in patients who do not have dilated ducts for diagnosis of common bile duct stones. Also available, as mentioned earlier, is MRCP or MRI technology, which has a diagnostic accuracy of 97%. If, however, you're with me at University of Tennessee, you know that our first opening for an elective MRI is next Tuesday at 2 a.m. So the cost and availability can be a limitation there. I was specifically asked to talk about endoscopic ultrasound as well. Endoscopic ultrasound uses the same ultrasonic technology at the end of a gastroscope to image multiple things, but specifically the extra ductal biliary system can be seen in up to 96% of patients. This has a sensitivity and a specificity in the low 90 percentiles, and because of this gives a negative predictive value of 97%, and I think that's the important part about endoscopic ultrasound is realizing that the negative predictive value is where its strength is. Limitations in this imaging modality, as with others, Specifically, air in the common bile duct limits the ability of the ultrasound wave to travel. And sometimes this is the patient population in which you really need this to work. That could be a patient with a previous sphincterotomy or patients with coloenteric fistulas. There's also a variability of the endoscopist that plays into the diagnostic accuracy of this technique. When looking at the role of endoscopic ultrasound in the diagnosis of common bile duct stones, it's not firmly established at this point. In patients who have a high probability, and most studies use the 70th percent as a cutoff, um, those patients are generally referred either for laparoscopic common duct exploration and or ERCP because of the need for intervention in that population. And Dr. Um, Nathanson in the last talk showed a beautiful differentiation on the points to help with that. In terms of the endoscopic ultrasound benefit, these are great for patients who have undergone a previously unsuccessful ERCP, patients who have a high risk of pancreatitis, specifically your idiopathic pancreatitis patients without a clear biliary source, and patients in whom radiation exposure carries higher risk because, again, the negative predictive value of an EUS may save them that future procedure. In terms of the high risk, you saw a nice slide earlier specifically looking at abdominal pain, elevated bilirubin, amylase, lipase, and this basically just reconfirms those standard factors. It has been reported that an endoscopic ultrasound followed by an EUS guided ERCP may be the way to go, especially if you're looking at patients in the preoperative setting. Specifically in that setting, the patients are under anesthesia for their endoscopic ultrasound. They're located in the GI lab. It does not have the cost of an additional procedure, just the length of time associated with the additional ERCP. Using an EUS guided ERCP as compared to performing just the ERCP for both diagnosis and potentially therapeutic intervention reduced the need for ERCP by 67%. It also reduced the risk of complication rates, including pancreatitis, between the EUS guided ERCP and ERCP alone in that patient population. Less than 1% chance of missing stones with that combination. 
again, kind of summarizing the difference between EUS and ERCP, EUS is better, presuming that you do not have a diagnostic ultrasound or MRCP showing your common duct stones than ERCP in the low-risk patient population. Specifically, ERCP carries a complication rate between 3 and 7 percent, and that most commonly is related to pancreatitis and hemorrhage, but is also a therapeutic intervention. And ERCP, as we're transitioning to that portion of the talk, has a clearance of stones from the common bile duct, 75 percent in the first procedure, 95 percent in the second procedure. So looking at my algorithm, having all of these tools in my armamentarium, indications that I see for precholecystectomy ERCP would be specifically biliary clearance in patients with acute cholangitis, especially with stones noted on imaging as the etiology behind that. Gallstone pancreatitis, because again, a lot of the time these patients are quite ill and need the supportive care of the ICU before they're able to have their cholecystectomy. And also in patients with a dilated common bile duct, jaundice, and stones, if it would change your surgical management. And specifically, there are patients who have findings on their MRCP and findings on their ultrasound that raise the suspicion for a biliary stricture. We know that stasis of bile can lead to formation of stones proximally, and if that biliary stricture would be a malignancy and this would change your management plan surgically, that's an important person on whom to evaluate this and diagnose this ahead of time. Additionally, patients who have a high likelihood of incomplete endoscopic clearance, if they are going to have an ERCP, should have this done before surgery. And the reason for this is you maintain many more options, specifically for things like a rendezvous combination endoscopic laparoscopic procedure, by knowing that you failed endoscopically first. So patients with duodenal diverticulum who have a difficult cannulation of the ampulla, people with altered gastric anatomy, your Bill Roth II reconstruction, your Ruin Y reconstructions, things like this are especially difficult from just a straight endoscopic perspective. And with the gastric bypass patient population and the separation of the esophageal lumen from the gastric remnant, this becomes a, a very important patient population to consider, and the transgastric approach does work well for that. Additionally, patients with common bile duct stones that are greater than one centimeter in size, as many of these patients, instead of just a standard lap coli, may actually need a cholidocal duodenal bypass. Also, patients who are high operative risk and may not be good candidates for the lap coli may still need temporization with an ERCP. And then finally, and this was a very tricky slide for me to put in here because I do think that this is a controversial issue, but hospitals where common bile duct exploration is not a, quote, good choice, whether that's lack of comfort and experience, whether that's lack of equipment and facilities, you know, this concept applies in the pre- and post-surgery setting, and I do think that any surgeon can learn to do this if they would like to learn to do this, but people who have not learned it can't offer that as a treatment step. Again, relative contraindications for the endoscopic approach, specifically ERCP, altered anatomy, specifically that Ruin Y anatomy that we talked about. And again, many of us are doing a transgastric approach, placing a 15 millimeter laparoscopic trocar through the anterior wall of the gastric remnant, passing the side viewing duodenoscope through this, performing our ERCP as necessary, done at the same time simultaneous with the cholecystectomy in these patients. Again, large stones that wouldn't pass, most likely despite sphincterotomy, again, maybe requiring a bypass, and pregnancy because of the radiation exposure component. And again, just for the plug of the ERCP indications, other things that do often come up in patients presenting with jaundice, palliation of biliary obstruction, either unknown etiology or pancreatitis, treatment of common duct strictures, benign or malignant, will often depend on which type of stent and what types of intervention you will perform there, but allows for tissue sampling and diagnosis of the etiology of the stricture, aiding in postoperative biliary leaks, and again, sphincter of OD dysfunction treatment. When we look at the basic steps of the ERCP, it starts with cannulation of the common bile duct and performing the cholangiogram. Often this will confirm expected pathology based on what your pre-op indications are for performing this test, whether that's ultrasound, MRCP, or intraoperative cholangiogram driven in terms of the expectation, and then considering different options for treatment. 
The endoscopic biliary sphincterotomy is often the first step after cannulation in your cholangiogram because this will allow for often decompression of the common bile duct, particularly if it's due to an ampullary stricture or a distal stone. The end of the autotome, which is a device used to cannulate the uh, sphincter, has a pull wire collect connected to electrocautery that can be used similar to in the operating room with the bovi function um, to perform the sphincterotomy of the sphincter of Odi over the common bile duct, opening this area and allowing for decompression. If this does not decompress the bile duct spontaneously, it also allows for the introduction of larger working instruments as well as the extraction of larger stones now that you don't have a flow resistance at this location. In terms of stone extraction, the most common extractive technique is a balloon biliary extraction as shown in the lower photo. This includes putting up a balloon above the lowest stone. Again, if there are multiple stones, you'd like to remove them in a sequential fashion stepwise as compared to impacting them into the ampulla and sweeping down the stone into the lumen of the bowel, allowing it to pass spontaneously. Again, the similar baskets that you saw in Les's videos earlier are often used endoscopically as compared to in the standard bile duct exploration technique. Endoscopic stenting is also an important thing to consider. If you remember from the earlier slide, we have a 75% chance of clearing the stone on our first attempt, 95% on the second. This is our temporization option. These are commonly a plastic stent. They're placed up into the common bile duct and they work to soften and slowly mechanically lithotripsy through that stone over time, allowing for the second repeat ERCP performed four to six weeks later to allow for complete extraction. I was also asked to address the complications and there are many complications associated with all endoscopic procedures, specifically those that are generally related to the procedure as compared to those that are specific for the ERCP. Most common is desaturation, medication reactions, and perforation of the endoscope being a very rare but dreaded complication. Specific to ERCP is a 2% risk for bleeding. This is most commonly related to a sphincterotomy and the cutting of that sphincter of OD. Infection, and I'm going to go into this shortly in a moment in more detail. Pancreatitis, ranging from 3 to 5% and doubling if a sphincterotomy is performed. Retroperitoneal and duodenal perforation and a very small mortality rate. Ascending cholangitis is the most common infectious complication related to ERCP. This ranges anywhere from half a percent up to 10 percent depending on the studies in which you're evaluating. I think the most important determinant of the development of this is getting a complete drainage of the bile duct. So an incomplete drainage of the common bile duct usually leads to infection because of the introduction of bacteria from the duodenal lumen into that area, the stasis, et cetera. Um, in terms of the mainstay of treatment, ductal decompression is the most important thing that you can do for these patients, and the rest is supportive care in terms of antibiotic therapy, IV fluid resuscitation, presser use is necessary. Acute cholecystitis follows a similar pathologic development in terms of introduction of bacteria during the ERCP up into the common bile duct. And this, in combination with our lovely dense contrast that we use, leads to a poor emptying of that fluid and potentially inflammatory obstruction around the cystic duct. And again, many of the patients who are having a preoperative ERCP are going to go ahead for having a laparoscopic cholecystectomy later in time. In terms of non-patient related infectious risks, this has come up in the literature lately. And this is primarily related to contaminated equipment. Episodes of carbapenem resistant Enterobacter, Klebsiella, and E. coli have been reported from the elevator of the duodenoscope being inadequately cleaned. And I would like to stress the importance of adherence to guidelines, particularly there's gas sterilization techniques that can be applied to this that reduce these infectious risks to patients. In terms of prevention of infection, I think definitely properly cleaned endoscopes plays into this, but also the use of sterile contrast material with the usage of the minimal amount necessary because of that osmotic factor. Specifically, the most important, in my opinion, is to obtain endoscopic decompression. If you're not able to do this endoscopically, you have to come up with another alternative, whether that's a surgical decompression, as has, will be talked about in many other sessions and has been this morning, or whether that's a percutaneous drainage from your interventional radiology colleagues as a temporizing me measure. Additionally, antibiotic prophylaxis as compared to treatment for patients with cholangitis is important with anyone who comes in with a biliary obstruction, anyone who has poor decompression while they're waiting for a 
subsequent procedure for decompression or in patients with liver transplants because of their immunocompromised status. In summary, I do think that there are many endoscopic options that do have benefit in terms of the treatment of a common bile duct, specifically with regards to the stone management. And I think that ERCP and EUS do offer wonderful adjuncts, and they should be used as an algorithmic step in the management of these patients.